In Arizona's Valley of the Sun, dealing with the heat is second nature to the area's nearly 3.5 million residents. It comes with the territory. But this weekend, 22 drivers have come to Phoenix looking to push the mercury a little higher. Two weeks ago at the IndyCar season opener in Miami, South African Thomas Schechter put his Pennzoil Chevrolet on the pole and was primed to open the 05 season with a bang. With his usual aggressive style of take no prisoners and a make no friends approach, Schechter had the number four Chevrolet in perfect position for a run to the checkered flag. When a great day of racing came to a sudden and violent stop. We've got a big crash in turn number one. Maybe as much as half of the field involved in this incident. When the smoke cleared, the day was done for eight drivers, including Schechter. It's really upsetting and pisses me off. I'm sorry it does. Danica Patrick tried to thread the needle, only to come up just a little short. I remember actually flying off the car and going to the wall and thinking, uh-oh. So it's my stumbling about, I wasn't sure what my name was there. When the racing resumed, Andretti Green team member Dan Weldon proved to be the class of the field. Your winner, Dan Weldon, picks up the victory. It looks like Sam Hornis Jr. will grab second. Today, Tony Kanaan attempts to pull a three-peat at Phoenix. It's IndyCar Racing from Arizona. Welcome to Arizona and Phoenix International Raceway for ABC's coverage of the XM Satellite Radio Indy 200. Today, Scott Sharp makes his 100th IndyCar Series start, and we welcome back Danica Patrick after her incident at Homestead, Miami. Also, Tony Kanon, the 2004 IndyCar Series champion, he goes for an unprecedented three-peat here at Phoenix International Raceway. And hello once again, everyone. I'm Todd Harris. Well, Mother Nature was supposed to deliver the sun, but she is capricious at best. And today we've got partly cloudy skies. There is a forecast for showers, but we hope to get the entire race in in its entirety. And as usual, we'll be bringing you some great coverage, similar to what you saw at Homestead over on our sister network, ESPN. But today, ABC is proud to bring you side-by-side -side coverage. Now, what that means is when we go to commercial on one side of your screen, you will see and hear the commercial in its entirety, but on the other side, you will see continual racing should be very exciting. Right now, we go to the front of the pack. That's where Jack Aroot is standing by. Todd, round up the usual suspects when you talk about the front row. It's all Andretti Green racing. No surprise, Dan Weldon on the front row on the outside. He was the winner two weeks ago in Miami. Maybe a little bit of a surprise is his teammate, Brian Herta, puts his car on the pole position for the first time in his career. But the seeds for this effort were sown back in the offseason. Remember, Brian Herter was the teammate for the four-car juggernaut that resulted in a championship last year. But that is a thing that Brian Herter has thought about all in the offseason, saying, if I perform well at the beginning of the season, by the time we get to Indy, maybe it'll be my turn to chase for the championship. Let's check in with my fellow pit reporter, Jerry Bunch. Thanks, Jack. You know, not only did reigning series champion Tony Kanaan win the last two IndyCar Series events here at Phoenix in 2003 and 2004, he did so in dominant fashion, leading a combined 270 of 400 laps. But today, the drive for the three-peat might be in jeopardy because yesterday, a rare overheating problem caused an engine change. And today, the champion will start in the final row. Now, historically, this finicky racetrack rewards patience and punishes those who push too hard too fast. Here's a tip early on, folks, on where to watch. Tony Kanaan is not known for his patience. So don't be surprised early on. We see a little St. Patrick's Day weekend fireworks coming from the back of the pack in this green car. Jamie? Well, Jerry, at the 2005 IndyCar season opener at Miami, 22-year-old Danica Patrick felt the eyes of the racing world turn upon her. To her, though, riding the fast track to the greatest spectacle in racing is no surprise or accident. Danica took the karting world by storm as a young girl and worked her way up through the ladder of open-wheel racing. Under the watchful eye of racers Lynn St. James and now team owner Bobby Rahal, she's now ready for prime time. Make no mistake, though, it's her own drive within that has made Danica a household name. Upon taking the stage at Homestead, she conquered the hurdles of completing pit stops under race conditions and even managed to show a few IndyCar bets that she means business. However, on lap 159, a multi-car accident ended Danica's day. 
Even at a young age, she knew her mission in life. The one thing missing from this room, though, is the Indianapolis 500 trophy. That's my goal. And the engines have started. Danica Patrick has now climbed into her car for her second IndyCar start. I just spoke to her a few moments ago. She said considering that concussion 13 days ago, she's feeling great. She checked out 100%. But what makes her nervous is her lack of confidence in the car. She hasn't had much seat time. She doesn't know what to expect on this track. And as Scott Goodyear and Jill DeFerrin well know, the learning curve here at Phoenix is quite steep. I'm happy to have two men working with me in the booth this year who know a little something about winning, driving, and more importantly about Phoenix International Raceway. We check in now with Scott Goodyear and Jill DeFerrin. Thank you, Todd. Jill DeFerrin, you know this racetrack like I do. We've both had great success here. We've also crashed here. This racetrack is very difficult. It's a one-mile track. They call it a driver's track, and both ends are different as far as the turns are concerned. A very technical racetrack, hard to set a car up. I tell you, Scott, to me, this is one of the most daunting racetrack any race car driver could come to. I don't care if you're coming here for a race or for a test. When you arrive here in the morning, there is that, that feeling in your stomach. And there is no such thing as a small accident in Phoenix. And I had one of the biggest accidents of my career here in 2003. Just a very aggressive drive that you have to do to get into turn one, trying to pass Michael Andretti and just that hit. A huge hit. They saved one of the largest hits actually in the IRL history. And here's my situation. The debris coming off the car when I drove for Penzo a few years ago. Whenever there's an accident here, you actually have to watch up above because because of this one mile racetrack, debris comes from every which direction. All right, thank you, gentlemen, as the cars are now on the track and rolling as we take a look at our XM satellite radio starting grid at the top of your screen. And three drivers to keep an eye on. One's a two-time defending champ, a local, and a driver who has the Midas touch when it comes to one-mile tracks. Tony Kanan, car number 11. Buddy Rice, car number 15. Dario Franchi, car number 27. So as they warm their tires and come around one more time, we take a look at our target, keys to racing. And gentlemen, there's a lot of them here on this very tricky track. We'll start with you, Scott. Well, you know, the key thing right now, I think, is going to have to be negotiating traffic because the key thing, guys are going to run fast through a segment and sometimes they're going to end up being able to go quick. They're going to have to get through all that traffic in front of them without hitting anything. Tire wear and consistency is also a big issue. To go 70-odd laps in a few tank here and still be quick in the end of the, the few is very, very difficult. Driver fitness, every driver out here is absolutely fit, so we have to make sure they can sit in the saddle for a complete stint. Green the green flag is out. Release the hounds in Phoenix. As they go into turn one, and that is the tricky one all weekend long, gentlemen. That's where we saw the problems. And you saw Tony Kanaan had the green car with the white on it going around the high side as we're now watching Thomas Schechter in the four car. And there we're back to Tony Kanaan around the outside. Jill, you know how hard that is, man. He's got his foot in it. This is unbelievable. He must have passed at least 10 cars in that first lap. That's really incredible. And even Scott Sharp, who was second quickest in warm-up this morning, and right now, he's just looking towards the front of the field. The best time to pass people, as he looks right now on Darren Manning, is at the beginning of the race or restart. Nothing like dropping over 11 cars to get to the front of the pack. Meanwhile, it is Dan Weldon out in front, followed by Brian Herman and Elio Castro Nevis. Your top three were underway here at Phoenix International Raceway. Scott Dixon tried to play it smart there, tried to sort of give him no room, had to shoot high or low, but actually he said, I'm going past, guys. There's Weldon right now, and Todd, as we saw last weekend, very strong. Well, when we were following Tony, then obviously went by Brian, and he's starting to pull away a little bit, and you see Sam around the outside of Dario, 
Is he gonna make it? Oh, he's got a run ahead on the. Ooh, that was close. The yellow four car is Thomas Schechter, the man we talked about at the top of the show. Right behind him is 27. That's Dario Frank. He's still the there. Husband. Watch. He's still there. He's still there. To Ashley Judd, and then behind him it is a Penske ride coming into view, tucking it right in behind him. That's number six, the red and white of Sam Hornis Jr. Sam always likes the outside. The outside is his preferred uh, place. Here he goes. He's got to run. On board with Thomas Schechter getting that rear view, and it's amazing how close Sam is riding to the back right rear tire of Dario Franchini. No room for error there, I can tell you that. You know, the temperatures are quite cool here. They're in the 60s. Last year, we had record heat. It was 91 degrees in Phoenix. Set a record. A different racetrack today than what the guys were used to a year ago. Right now, though, Jill, we always talk about, as we saw Sam Hornish trying to get around the outside of Dario Franchitti. It's tire temperatures, tire pressures right now. We're only five laps into this. The 27 is Dario Franchitti. Just ahead of him is the yellow four. That is Thomas Schechter of South Africa. And rounding out the threesome is Sam Hornish Jr. of the red and white Pennzoil. Excuse it's, me, Red and Marlboro. I tell you, it's a good time to tell you what my pick is for the race. Is that many watching there? Sam Hornish Jr. and Tony right there with him already. That's incredible. Tony Kanon starting in the back of the pack, and look at him now. That's unbelievable. And the last guy to win from the back of the pack here was Buddy Lazier in 2000. Had to make a motor change, much like Tony Kanon. Started at the back, won that race. And the reason I know that, guys, is because I was in second. I couldn't fin couldn't get up to him. There is Tony Kanon, the man who started at the back of the field. He is now running an incredible seventh place. So he has moved up so quick, and we've just completed eight laps. Sam is the reason that Tony Kanon had to start in the back is they had overheating problems with their engine. They changed engines and found out that that wasn't the problem. It was in the cooling system. But after they completed that change and found out they were going to be in the back of the back, Tony Kanon got his 7-Eleven team together and said, for all your hard work, guys, leave it to old TK. I'll bring the car to the front. This is by design thus far. Tony Kanon is on a mission. I tell you, that was the most unbelievable move. Everything is going on there. If we got to, Sam went by Dario in the middle of the whole, the whole traffic, and now he's trying to get by um, Thomas Schechter. And split Paul Dana when all that was going on, Jill, and you know when your car's not working right, you look in the mirror, you see three or four of those fast guys coming up behind you. You don't know, you don't want to turn the wheel. You just sort of sit in the middle of the track and say, please don't hit me. Is you are on board with Thomas Schechter just on his right-hand side. That is number six, the red and white car, Sam Hornish Jr. Outside again, outside. He's staying on the outside, and he's going to make it eventually. And he's my pick for the race, Scott. You know, and the re reason you say is the outside is because he has to keep part of his car in the clear air. And you can see his car just got a little bit loose there yeah, when he's coming loose. off the turn. <laughs> so what he'll have to do now is work with the weight jacker and the roll bars inside the car. Make sure he has the opportunity to calm the car down and calm himself down. I'm sure his nerves are on the edge right now. My nerves are on the edge, that's for sure. This is the sixth race in a row that Weldon has led, and he won two of those. An unbelievable performance. We're going to step aside and quit yapping and let our sponsors do the talking. You'll see all the action here on ABC Side by Side. Welcome back to Phoenix. That is the 15 car of Buddy Rice, and he came in contact coming out of turn two. Good to see the hands moving. Now he has the sign. He's taking the steering wheel off, and that's a great sign for the safety crew. Well, there was a big accident. Uh, you see the whole back end of the car is gone, and uh, hopefully he's okay. You know, he's a driver that's not had very much luck here. In all the years that he's come here, two ninth-place finishes and actually had the best qualifying in his run here just this weekend. Here we are right now coming off of turn two. He's by himself, Jill. It looks like his situation where the car is just loose and probably trying to hang on to that first fuel stint, and he gets the opportunity to change the car, but he didn't last that long. Yeah, here's the con whole consistency thing. It looks like his car just got loose at the at the end of the um, turn two, and he couldn't quite hold it. And Thank you. Th thankfully, he's out of the car. And when we talk about loose, that's when drivers in the car are actually feeling the back end of the car wants to swap ends with the front. And, Jill, you know you have an option of having the car push on the front or loose in the back. And if you have to choose one or the other, man, it's a lot more comforting to have that push. Let's check in pit row with Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, in the warm-up this morning, they had some issues here in the Ray Hall Letterman pit. Let's get up here with Scott Remke. And, Scott, I know you guys were battling some issues this morning in the final warm-up and made some changes. What was wrong with the car early on? What was he having trouble with? Yeah, it's uh, been kind of a forgetful weekend right now, but uh, he got a little loose there in traffic, and he was doing a pretty good job holding his own and just snapped all around on him. 
you made some changes after the warm-up this morning. I heard him say there was a lack of grip this morning. Uh, you added some, but it, well, obviously it wasn't enough. Yeah, I think we headed the right direction. We got the car a little better, but obviously not good enough. Any idea from the spotters how bad it is? No, we haven't talked to him yet. Um, we talked to Buddy on the radio. He's fine. That's what's important. Chief Operating Officer Scott Remke for Ray Hall Letterman. The driver is okay, but the car has some significant damage. Guys? All right, thank you, Doc. That's two early outs for the defending inning champion. This is Patrick Carpentier, and yesterday during practice, almost the identical spot that Buddy Rice went out, and this was an amazing wreck. You watch the car coming through the turn right now, and it just gets a little bit loose on me. does a quick correction. The back end doesn't swap ends, but he goes in there very, very hard. Went to the hospital because they had to do an X-ray on his chest because he had debris come inside the car. As the pits open, we check in with Jack Aru. And this pit stop by Tony Kanan by design. The Andretti Green team, knowing that Kanan had to come from the back, they're going to opt for fuel and tires. They knew they were in the back despite passing all those cars at the start. Now, according to Kim Green, they want a very long period of green flag racing. They feel that's what will earn them that front spot. You know what's interesting about uh, what just went on? Some of the leaders pitted and others didn't. It's very, very unusual for that to happen. So now we have cars out of sequence, Scott, and what could be a very quick race. You like the strategy? Well, you know, Danny Weldon last week actually at Miami did not pit on the first opportunity also end up to win the race. So, you know, different strategies always work. Dan Weldon has led here the entire way in Phoenix at the Satellite Radio Indy 200, but you can hang on for the run all the way on ABC Sports as we take you side by side. Welcome back to Phoenix International Raceway. It's the XM Satellite Radio Indy 200. The XM Satellite Radio Indy 200 on ABC Sports is brought to you by XM Satellite Radio the exclusive satellite radio partner of the Indy Racing League. By Toyota, choose any direction as long as it's moving forward. And by Firestone Tires. 20 laps complete as we send it down to Pit Row and Jackaroo. Todd, 20 laps, you got plenty of fuel in a 30 gallon fuel cell to go longer than this before you pit. But the reason why some of these front running cars have decided to come on and top off the tanks and take on new tires. They are gambling that this race isn't going to go the full advertised 200 lap distance. Then you couple other teams up and down this pit road that are actually gambling that it will go. So what we've done basically is kind of like the World Series of Poker. Some people are betting on the come waiting for the river card. And Jamie Little, the river card in this instance is Mother Nature. That's right. So far, so good with Mother Nature. Tom McShector came in. He topped off his fuel. He got four tires. But, guys, he's taking this race very seriously. He's never done well here in Phoenix. The best ever was 16th place, and that was with a crash. As you know, their pit crew is on their pins and needles, on their toes here. They want to make it happen today. Thomas must finish this race. Keep your eyes on the big yellow number four. All right. Well, Jack brings up a good point, guys. You talk about the gamble that they're doing and uh, we t we look back to Homestead. I mean, we're 15 laps in and we already have an accident very reminiscent of what happened two weeks ago at Homestead Miami Speedway. It's now time for a little Homestead history. It's a four act play in how you collect eight cars in one turn. Act one, Kolsky Matsura. Watch Kolsky on the right side of your screen right now thinking, I've got it, I've got it. I'm going to get a great restart here. Watch the right rear tire dust on it. The car comes around, and now he's going, I wished I didn't do that. Kolsky, what are you doing? I can get it, I can get it. Oh, no, it's going to hurt. In the hands of Thomas Schechter trying to correct the car now along with Scott Sharp. Scott Sharp has absolutely nowhere to go. In act number two, it's Brian Herta and Scott Dixon. I'm going to go around the outside, too. Watch my move. Oops, wow. oops, oops. Uh, uh. And in slow motion, Scott Dixon has nowhere to go and goes, my day's over. In act three, Ed Carpenter gets clipped, and Danica Patrick tries unsuccessfully to thread the needle. Watch here. He just thinks he's going to make it through, and Kosky comes off the top side and breaks his right front suspension. Danica chooses the inside and thinks she's got just enough room, but unfortunately, quite not enough. Inside, lifts off the throttle. He's thinking, I can make it, I can make it, I can make it. Bang! Not quite. 
And in our final act, Carpentier, Mira, and Manny think they've escaped the danger only to be surprised. When this happens in front of you, you're watching for debris and watch the wing of Danica Patrick's car right now there in the air. He's going, I gotta get underneath this. Now Mira is looking to his right thinking Danica is gonna come in front of me. He does not see Manny on the inside. They touch, nearly taking both of them out. Well, we can have a little fun with that because everyone was okay. That was a seven second incident that cost over 2.1 million unfortunate dollars. You know, and on top of that, I think you have to add that you talk about the price there. No penalty to Koski actually from as far as monetary considerations, but he's on probation for the remainder of the year. I think the penalty was too soft, Scott. I would have given a, him a much harsher penalty. I know it wasn't intentional. I, will, I know it was just a mistake, but it was a mistake with big consequences. Well, we will revisit that later on in the telecast, but we got to remind you tomorrow at 3 Eastern, ABC Sports brings you a potential NBA Finals preview when Tim Duncan leads the San Antonio Spurs against the Detroit Pistons. Some of you will see the first place Suns of Phoenix take on the surprising Memphis Grizzlies. Check local listings for the game in your area. And let's set it down to pit row before we go green one more time with Jamie Little. Well, Buddy Rice just walked out. Buddy, first of all, are you okay? Oh, yeah, everything's okay right now. Scott Remke earlier was saying that you guys may have some had some issues earlier with your car. What was going on? Uh, we just made some changes before the start of the race, and uh, we're trying to improve the car, obviously, because we needed to get uh, points. And then when we have, uh, you know, we, as a con we work together to make those adjustments, and, uh, you know, it just doesn't help when I make a mistake like this, especially when we need points after what happened last uh, the last race. What was the mistake that you feel you made? Oh, I mean, just, you know, we're just trying to hang on, and things are super loose, and uh, just the way it goes, I mean... I mean, I guess I gotta slow it up a little bit more to try to can preserve it, but we're just trying to stay where we're at for right now until we got the first round of pit stops. But it's just the way it goes. You know, it has gotten colder since you guys ran this morning. Did that play a factor at all? No, I think more of it is just what we changed, and uh, we didn't come off. And you know, we were pretty good, I think, when we rolled off the trailer. Just the way the weather's changed, where everything's gone, it's just uh, we've lost the handle on the car for for this weekend. It's just uh, it's the way it goes. Very frustrating for the Ray Hall Letterman driver, Indianapolis 500 champion. He's been out now two races in a row, guys. Yeah, and Buddy Rice from this area, so very disappointing to him. As we take a look at our XM Satellite Radio Indy 200 current standings, it's Weldon, Herta, Franchitti, Manning, and Vitor Mira. Guys, the reason that Franchitti and Herta did not pit, two words, track position, and also another two words, two stops. They're going to try to make it on two stops on fuel. If we stay green, they may be able to do it, but it's a roll of the dice. Guys? All right, thank you, Doc, as they bring it around one more time on the back straightaway. There is your leader, the number 26 red and white climb tool ride of Dan Weldon. He won two weeks ago at our opener in Miami as he brings them up to speed. We are going green again in Phoenix. And that second car that's being split right now is Ed Carpenter, who's actually just a little bit behind, not in the race up front with those guys. And Dario made a very aggressive move inside Brian, but Brian is taking none of it. He went around the outside. He's still with a lot of throttle one and maintained his second position. So at the front of the field is Andre Green teammates Weldon, Herta, and Franchitti, one, two, and three. Dario Franchitti was very aggressive this morning on the warm-up. I saw him doing some very aggressive moves, just like that one he's trying to pull on the, on the Brian again. And I think he's, he's going to be strong for the rest of the day. Scott, are we just seeing Dan Weldon basically putting together everything he did in the offseason, the momentum he carried from last year, and now he's got the perfect setup? Dan Weldon last year was like a sponge, guys, with the three teammates that he had, just absorbing all their information, especially from Brian Herta, who's really the setup guy on that team. And Danny said many times, I couldn't do this without my teammates. I think he's been running second a few times, obviously won three times last year, won last weekend, but he now has his sights set on the championship and the Indy 500. This is Ryan Briscoe coming in, part of the Target Chip Ganassi team. The young man looks like he's changed that whole front end. He's a rookie out of Australia, and uh, he had a bit of a wiggle yesterday in practice as well. He did, and I spoke with him just after practice this morning. Thought he had not a bad car. He knows he needs experience. He needs to make sure he finishes races. Looks like, obviously, he touched somebody on that restart. That's why they had to change the wing. Once again, it's Dan Weldon coming into view, your first place car. Then it is Brian Herta and Dario Franchini, but look at this. 
in the back of the pack. Those are the two Marlboro Penske drivers right now, and they are currently battling almost with each other. Now, what's going to happen here? Those guys are battling each other, and exactly right now, Tony Kanaan in the green and white car is taking advantage of those guys slowing each other up, trying to get past each other, and he'll take advantage of this. A very sly move, but very smart from Tony Kanaan. The first red and white car is Elio Castro Nevis, number three. The second red and white car is Sam Hornish Jr., and right behind him, that is the green and white. That is Tony Kanaan. He has won here the last two years in a row, and he is the defending champ. Well, the racing continues as we have completed 32 laps here at Phoenix International Raceway. We show it to you all on ABC Side by Side. Phoenix 41 laps complete. There is your leader, number 26, Dan Wilden, the man who won our season opener at Homestead, Miami. As we go on board the XM satellite car, Brian Hurd are currently sitting in second. Then it's Frank Keaty and Darren Manning and Koski Matsura. Now, Scott, you pointed out during the side-by-side, -side, Darren Manning is running a very impressive race. Very strong. He's been quiet, actually, all weekend. Not really been that strong in the practice sessions or really qualifying, but his car is hooked up right now, being able just to run in front of those guys. And I got to say that he's got to be very, very strong. There's your leader, 26. That is Dan Weldon out in front as we go on board with Darren Manning. The target, Chip Ganassi, ride the number 10 vehicle. And right now, it looks like he's starting to slide back just a little bit because Elio Castroneves, the number three red and white, gets around him. Now watch his hands if the car's starting to go away on him because it was so competitive at the beginning. Watch his hands. If it's not working well, you'll start to see him really move his hands a lot on the steering wheel. Well, there's a huge amount of traffic over there. And we spoke to you about traffic when the race started. And there's people everywhere. This is a line of cars. And I believe Ed Carpenter is the first guy in the front of that line is, is holding people up. And, and that's what's going on right now. There's a lot of people changing position. Now watch his hands right now. There's you can see there. right there. See how he's working the steering wheel. His right hand should only probably come to there if the car's working well. His right hand's going up to the top. That's the understeer that we talk about, Jill DeFerrin. So that means he's not getting through the turns as fast as he wants to. The tension and the drivers right now is incredible because you know any mistake you make somebody's by you and here is Sam trying to get by Tony oh that's going to be tight Tony Kanaan right now is working on the backside of Darren Manning trying to get around him he checks his rear mirrors and here comes Sam Hornish Jr. Well the thing is you're trying to pass the guy if you don't make that move you got to back off and if you back off then here comes the guy behind you and tries to take your position it's very very difficult you got to be absolutely sure about your overtaking maneuver back on board the number seven of Brian Hurd and now back over to the target Chip Ganassi car and this was just moments ago on board with Darren Mann as he comes up on Paul Dana Paul Dana, a rookie right there. Watch his hands. He got hit on the right rear corner from Paul Dana, and shortly after that, Paul Dana came into the pits and had a problem with the right rear wheel bearing. He is now out of the race. Let's send it down to Jamie Little, who is with Chip Ganassi. And he's the owner for the number 33, number 9, and number 10 cars. Tough track out here. A lot of contact already. How are your two boys doing? Yeah, again, we had a little rookie mistake there. I don't know what happened. One of the Penske cars, I think, touched him, but... Uh put up with when you have a new driver on these ovals. Well, Chip is never won here at the Dr. Fox, what's happening with Dana? Well, Jamie, down here, rookie Paul Dana has climbed out of the Himmelgarn car. And Paul, what, what, what put you out? Well, we just, we never really recovered from our crash yesterday in practice. We're not really up to speed. And I'm in the way out there. One of the Ganassi cars just ran over me. Now, he could have not run over me, but we could also be up to speed. So it's kind of our fault. The other thing is we didn't have any radio communication, so I couldn't hear my spotter. The crew can't talk to me. We couldn't really effectively, like, tune the car to try to get back in the game. So uh, the front end was bent up a little bit. We just thought it'd be better to park it, get out of everybody's way, and get some testing in, try to be better for Motegi. Paul Dana after a top 10 in Miami, a tough start here at Phoenix. Let's check in with Jack. Well, Jerry, we're talking about the failure of a rear wheel bearing on Paul Dana's car. Thanks to the folks at Target Chip Ganassi, we have our very own cutaway car here on the rear. Let's take the wheel off and take you down into the area. Right here in the midst of the hub, beyond the brake caliper and the brake rotor, there are simple ball bearings that make this entire beast turn freely. Those are the bearings burned out on Paul Dana's car and the reason why he's on the sidelines. Fellas? All right, thank you, Jack. Some of the greatest racing we've seen thus far taking place on the track with 52 laps complete. There's your leader, Dan Weldon, but the real battle sliding back there as they are jockeying for position. Well, Dan Weldon is really pulling away from everybody. He's now 4.5 seconds 
ahead of Brian Herter, really in a class of his own so far. And on the Toyota lap leaders, you saw Dan Weldon, 50 of the 53 laps, he has already led out in front, so he's certainly working up the momentum of his victory at Homestead, Miami. And we've got a great race going on with Hornish right now, just being able to pass people, and yes, Cow and guys are running very, very strong, but here comes Kanaan as he's moving up at the same time underneath Danica Patrick. Tony Kanaan, number 11, the green and white car getting around. Danica Patrick, number 16, the Argent Pioneer ride, a teammate to Buddy Rice. And I'll tell you what, Tony Kanaan may be the snake line in the grass because for a man starting the back of the pack, he's looking to pull a Buddy Lazier. I tell you, he's uh, going very, very, very well. That whole group is going very well. Koski Matsuda, who had a horrible race in Homestead, is doing a brilliant job today. He's now running seventh. He was running fourth for most of the time. He's trying to put a lap on Danica. That was very, very close. And Eli was made. Elio Castro Neves is now running fourth and Tony in hot pursuit. Great racing thus far at the XM Satellite Radio 200. We have just over 140 laps remaining until the exciting conclusion, and you will see it all right here on ABC Sports as we go side by side. Welcome back to ABC's coverage of the XM Satellite Radio Indy 200 at Phoenix International Raceway. Your leader continues to be Dan Weldon, followed by Brian Herter, Dario Franchitti. They are all teammates. Elio Castroneves in a great position in fourth. And then the fourth and final member of that Andretti Green team, Tony Kanaan, currently sitting in fifth. Gentlemen, traffic is going to start being an issue here, Jill, real soon. Well, it is an issue right now, Todd. I mean, what you're seeing there is the leader, Dan Weldon, in heavy, heavy, heavy traffic. And a few laps ago, he had a five-second lead. The, his lead is down to 1.4 seconds. And he had a few moments very, very close. And this is a key moment of the race because if he makes a mistake in traffic, he can lose the lead just like that or even worse. An interesting note, though, Dan Weldon has yet to pit. Also, Brian Herta, Dario Franchitti, Koski Matsura, Darren Manning, and Vitor Mira, none of them pitted on that first pit stop. And you actually watch Dan Weldon right now as he comes up behind Dixon trying to put him a lap down. Danny's car is loose, Jill. You can see it. The thing keeps moving in the center of the turn. But the other key thing for him is he's one of the guys that did not stop on that first caution. He's going to need fuel very shortly. The first guy on the order strategy, or the guys that stopped on the first yellow, is Elio Castroneve, who's sitting pretty in fourth place. I mean, he is looking very, very strong with Tony Canan also on the uh, stop on the first uh, yellow, They're looking very strong. On board with Thomas Schechter. And there you see the Firestone telemetry, 171 miles an hour, lifting a bit right there, lifting a lot right there. Always but, happens in the race trim. You see that number we're talking about, that throttle number. Full throttle going down the straights. And watch the G's increase here as we go through the turn. Up to over 3.5, 3.8. In qualifying, Jill DeFerrin, you know that you see 4.2. Yeah. Dario Franchini makes a move. That's a pass for second. He just got around O'Brien, which was surprising because a few laps ago he wasn't that close. Brian must have got held up in, uh, in traffic. So it's now Dan Weldon, Dario Franchini right there in the number 27, getting past his teammate number 7, Brian Herta, who also needs to pit. And Dan Weldon is right in front of him. He's got Weldon within his sights. Let's sit it down to Pit Row and Jackaroo. Well, guys, we're about to see pit stops from the teams that did not pit, as you alluded to just a couple of moments ago. Once they take on their fuel and look for the leader, Dan Weldon, to try and solve a slightly loose condition with the race car in traffic. But you know who's going to end up battling for the lead in maybe 20 laps or so? It'll be the three of Elio Castroneves and the 11 of Tony Kanaan. Why? Because all of a sudden, they have worked their way to the front. They can go an extra 30 laps before they have to pit. Dario Franchini making the move, the number 27, right next to Dan Weldon, his teammate, number 26. That was a brilliant pass for the lead, and again, in traffic. Dan got held up in traffic, Dario didn't, he had a run. Here we go. And Jill, Dario did the perfect thing because he saw the traffic up there, he knew his teammate was loose, and he just sat there and pounced on the opportunity. So Dan Weldon comes into pit row. Vitor Mir has also been in and out as we check in with Jerry Punch. Brian Herta says do not change a thing at all. Perfect pit stop 
Pitt will check in with Jack in the Weldon Pit. Nominal pit stop for your leader at the time. They're going to make an adjustment to the wing. They take a half, a full two, a full turn down on the right side. He's off and away, and he will win the drag race out to the line and back on the track. And that drag race is because Weldon's pit is one of the first pits down by turn one. And then you have Hurd is back, and we have a yellow. Coming down the front straightaway, it is Thomas Engie, and that is the number two Rockstar car. Dario Franchini's already in the pit, so he's got to come through, because the pits are closed. Wow, that was a unfortunate turn of events for Franchini, thinking that he pitted at the perfect time. I think uh, that's really going to affect him not very well. And here is Thomas Engie, who was very, very impressive in practice, qualified well in seventh place, also qualified well in Homestead, but again, not uh, very good luck in the race. I and guess. I think I can tell you what actually what happened with Thomas Engie's car there. It's been off song when we say that for the last couple of laps. The car has actually not sounded well, so we think that he might have had just a motor problem. There he is up on the high side. Well, I take that back because even though his car has been off song, he's trying to make way for the guys to get underneath him. He got himself up in the gray area on that dirty stuff, put himself into the wall. I know what happened. He, um, uh, Daddy was coming into the pits and Thomas was uh, behind him. And, uh, you know, he didn't have enough room and uh, had to run wide. And that was that. That is Thomas Ingi, the Panther racing ride. The number two originally from the Czech Republic, now living in Monaco as we check in one more time with Jack Aroop. Well, let's check in with Michael Andretti. That caution is not what you wanted to see, Michael, for your team and especially for Dan Weldon. No, that hurt for him and Brian, for sure. Now they got the work cut out for him. Uh a bummer but what can you do now Tony Kanan has gone off schedule just a bit by pitting early very un very unusual for your team to divvy up strategies was it due to the fact that he had to start in the back that you decided to go that way well I think so and he was you know the last one in line so he was the one that uh, you know was in a position to take the biggest chance and it looks like it may pay out for him now how many chances will the, the guys that now have been hurt by this caution have to take it's still a long way to go I mean you know if there's another caution they'll get waved around and they'll get the lap back so it's not over it ain't over till it's over Jerry and guys the concern here in the Franchini pit that's why Kyle Moyer has been trying to plead his case with the Indy Racing League officials that we are so close on fuel if you do not open the pits we're going to run out here we have got to come on the pit road and they have been told from the tower, if you're going to run out of fuel, we'll open the pits. Well, the pits are open now, so here they come down pit road at 60 miles an hour. Fred Keedy, who won twice a year ago on one-mile ovals, wants a half a turn of front wing, a slight adjustment of front wing to change the downforce on the car. Fred Keedy will make it on one more fuel stop if we stay green, but they've got to get it full of fuel. They're waiting 11 seconds for them down to Jackaroo. Tony Kanan completing his stop, and as you heard Michael Andretti, his owner, say just a couple of minutes ago, while it was bad for his teammates, maybe this yellow has been good for TK. He will be able to top the tank off, and fellas, it should be one more stop for Tony Kanan, and he can go the distance. Nearly the entire field takes that opportunity to open the pits, and perfect timing for Dario Franchini, as they pointed out. Dr. Jerry Punch saying that they were pleading their case, saying we're going to run out of gas, and almost on cue, the pits opened up, and Dario able to come in. We're going to step aside, take a break here on ABC Sports, but you will miss nothing from the XM Satellite Radio Indy 200 as we take you side by side. Welcome back to Phoenix. As we are still under yellows, we take a look at our Toyota lap leaders. Dan Weldon, a whopping 72 laps led. Castro Nevis, five, and Dario Franchini picking up a pair. Interesting story, though, while we were side by side, Tony Kanan, who was momentarily in the lead, had to come in. And the key thing, Tony came in after just having a pit stop just a lap or so earlier, did not get the fuel in the car. This is the first year of a new single fuel probe that they actually plug in. You can see some difficulty going on there with the fuelers. Now, he's pointing to it, did not get the fuel in, so they'll have to bring him back around and just put fuel in the car, which is exactly what they did. Talk about frustrating because he was in a perfect position. And the green flag is out. We are off and running once again. It's Elio Castro Nevis who assumes the lead. The number three red and white of Marlboro Penske out in front. That's going to put a smile on Roger Penske's face because right behind him is his teammate Sam Hornis Jr. 
Jill, you know this is a great time to pass cars being very aggressive, which we saw the 27 car of Dario Franchitti there going so fast but had nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. I mean, it's a narrow track, and here it comes. He's been very, very aggressive today. I think he's a man on a mission today. Well, the word from the pits is Dario Franchitti a little upset with teammate tactics down there. We'll follow up on that story, but Brian Hurd and he getting together, and hopefully it'll end amicably, but Dario Franchitti right now, you seem to like the way he's driving. Well, he, he needs to try to forget about that and just concentrate on his driving. You know, sometimes when you drive on this type of racetrack, a lot of stuff happens, and here he goes. Ooh, that was close. He's still there. Down the inside, he's got a run of him. Dario Franchini on the inside, number 27 on the outside. Him is number 55. That is Koski Matsura on the high side as we check yeah. in quickly with Dr. Jerry Punch. Guys, you're exactly right. Dario Franchini is a man possessed. He is driving like it, and he is talking like it on the radio. He does not like the fact that some of the traffic is holding him up, even if some of the traffic is still in the spot in front of him on the racetrack. He has been very animated on the radio. He really wants this one here on the one-mile track. As we look at the number 27, that is Dario Franchitti, but our leader, Elio Castroneves, has now led in four of his five IndyCar starts at Phoenix. So while Tony Kanaan has really dominated the last two years here, Elio Castroneves has been extremely consistent as we check in with Jamie Little. Well, team owner of the number two, that's two weeks in a row you guys have been off the track in the middle of the race. What happened there, Doug? You guys were quickest this morning in the warm-up. I don't know, we struggled a little bit from the beginning, just trying to get Thomas comfortable in the car. So we were just trying to sort things out, give him some seat time. Unfortunately, Nicky let Dario go in to get in the pits. He got up in the marbles and hit some pits. You're in a lot of Dario Franchitti in all the pits, guys. Well, the race out front now, it is all Marlboro. Team Penske, your leader, number three, Elio Castroneves, with Sam Hornish Jr. behind him, and they are really getting close. Sam Hornish seems to have the drive. Sam is trying. I mean, I think he's trying to pass Elio. There's no team orders between the two, and he looks very comfortable in the outside line, which gives him clean air, and Scott can talk about that. A and that's bit. the line he seems to always favor, isn't it? Well, the key thing is you don't want to be directly behind the car in front for the simple reason that these cars near air going through them to give them great aerodynamics. And the best way to talk about that is if you've ever followed a tractor trailer on the highway and felt your car buffet, that's exactly what Sam Hornish is feeling right now. He has to pick and choose the proper time to make his move, Jill. And a little bit behind him, we got our man, Dario Franchitti, trying to catch these two guys. He's running three to four mile an hour faster than them, and here he is on the screen now. And this is gonna really heat up in a few minutes. As we come up on the halfway point of the XM Satellite Radio Indy 200 strategy really coming into play. For Tony Kanaan, he started in the back, worked his way up. Now he finds himself towards the back, but it is Elio Castroneves and Sam Hornish Jr. right now going one and two. Yeah, Tony had to drive all the way from the back the first time around, and now he's doing it all over again, but he's already sixth. I'll tell you what, that Andretti Green team is like bad luggage. You can't get rid of them. There's always one of them poking their head in, and this time it's Dario Franchitti messing up what would be a perfect day for Roger Penske's boys. Well, the day's still young. We have got 107 laps to go, but right now it is Elio Castroneves, number three, Sam Hornish Jr., number six, both red and white out in front, and the car in third place, number 27, that is the blue and red car of Dario Franchitti. This officially can be considered a three-way battle at this point because if Sam makes a little mistake or Elio makes a little mistake, Dario will be right there and will be ready to attack. So this very tense moment, especially for Sam, because he's like the meat in the sandwich. Scott, at the top of the show, we talked about Dario Franchitti having the Midas touch when it comes to these mile tracks. Why is that? Well, you know, I would have to say maybe a year or so ago as you watch Castro Nevis now actually going around the traffic. A very crucial time there. Timing is very important when you come up to traffic. The key thing right now for Frank Keaty is his situation within the team. He knows he's very strong. You know, he's not a young chicken, but the key thing, I never thought he was aggressive on one-mile tracks, but lo and behold, last year he won on them. As they work their way around, the leaders are coming through. This time they will pass the 20. That is the vision of Ed Carpenter. And, oh, Ryan Briscoe moments ago having just a slight moment. On your right-hand side, gotten way high. Oh. Just skimmed the wall there on the right-hand side. And, Jill, that's when you know you go, man, I got away with one this time. Exactly. And thank God he got away with that one. 
97 laps complete. It is still Elio Castro Nevis, number three, and Sam Hornis Jr. out in front. And of course, we take no breaks in IndyCar racing, and neither does our coverage as we go side by side right here on ABC Sports. We are back to Phoenix International Raceway. Your leader, Elio Castroneves. It's an all new episode of Blind Justice. It's on Tuesday at 10, 9 Central. It's Steven Bochco's powerful new drama. Critics are calling it gripping, compelling, touching, terrific. Ron Eldard stars. He lost his sight, not his vision. And it's only on ABC. As we go on board with Thomas Schechter, now on board with Danica Patrick, as we take a look at the XM Satellite Radio Indy 200 current standings, it's Castroneves and Dario Franchitti slipping by Sam Hornish Jill during the back marker hunt. Yeah, Sam got stuck in traffic and he had to back off. I think he touched uh, AJ Foy and, uh, and Dari was by in a flash. As we take a look at our running order, 107 laps of a scheduled 200 are completed as Castro Nevis, Frank Keedy, and Sam Hornis Jr., your top three. And I'll tell you what, Elio Castro Nevis has been patient, and I know for Brazilians, Gil, that is not something you're born with. Uh, Elio is driving very, very well. He's being quite strategic and uh, keeping his lead. He's working well through traffic, and I think Dario is just waiting for the next bout of traffic to come along to start atta attacking again. So it's Castro Nevis and Franchitti right now going one and two. There is Dario Franchitti, number 27, the spouse, of course, of Ashley Judd. And it is Sam Hornish Jr., the sixth car, the red and white of Roger Penske, kind of lurking in there, Scotty. Lurking in there. Looked like he had a rubber wheel incident with A.J. Foyt, the fourth, actually in some traffic. So we'll have to watch to see if that's done any damage to the car, and it might affect how his race unfolds later on. The man looking for the three-peat here at Phoenix International Raceway, the 11 car just coming into view, the green and white of Tony Kanaan. He has been to the back of the pack twice, and he just keeps emerging towards the front, Jill. He is going very, very quickly. Obviously, his car is very good in traffic, very consistent. He keeps going forward, and he just passed Koski Masuda, who is really going well. He's running fifth place. He's been very, very smart in traffic. At it looks like he's going to stay there all day. Koski Matsura right there in fifth place, number 55, on board the Panasonic ride. An impressive ride, considering that he is currently on probation as we check in for more on him with Jack Aroop. Well, Tom, what Tom Anderson and the Fernandez team did for Koski Matsura after qualifying is they added an additional downforce to the car. At Phoenix here, these cars will generate about 3,800 pounds of downforce on a 1,900-pound car. Tom Anderson told me Koske wanted to be very, very stable in traffic, so they added that downforce factor by some 20%. What that, in essence, has given him is a Cadillac to drive here on this racetrack. Oh, my. Uh, that traffic wow. situation again and again and again. And is the key to the race is how you deal with this traffic situation. It's always there, it's unavoidable. And you saw Dario trying to set Elio up on the, on the main straight when he got traffic, and now Sam is trying to, to set Dario up. And that's really all the traffic really did. Oh, Bring it in, and we've got a yellow flag, and it looks like Ryan Briscoe once again. Is he's that not, the exact same spot? He's not having much fun today, I can tell you that. When I spoke to him, he said, I just need to get the miles on, as I mentioned before, and he seemed very content on doing that no matter where he finished. On board with Roger Yasakawa, the 24. Hang on, hold the brake. Taking go, his go, time. Go, 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 go. So Yasakawa making a very opportunistic pit stop. He will come back out, get in roll, but it is Ryan Briscoe that triggers the yellow flag as Yasakawa goes out, pit exit. Is that just a corner zill that for Ryan he just has not figured it out? He's just struggling today and, and when you're at this racetrack and the car is difficult to drive, it's, it's a long day. You just want to go home basically. Ryan Briscoe right there getting up very high. Yeah, just run up into the marbles and when you're in, in the marbles you have no more searing, no more grip and you're just there for the ride. Watch that, he's running a little high there, a little high. See you later, bye bye. A little bit of dirty air off the 17 car you saw on the bottom right hand part of your screen, Vitor Mira, and that probably caused his incident. 33 is Ryan Briscoe. He does make contact with the wall, but it looks like the vehicle structurally is okay. He's going to probably have to come in and have the tires replaced. I mean, passes on the outside like he was trying to do are very difficult to do. I mean, we see the guys that do it well, executing, no problem. So we think it's easy, but at that, what happened to 
Brian is so easy to happen, and that's why we're sitting here all tense, I guess. You know, in my discussion with him, he said he went back and watched the videos from Miami. He said, I learned a lot. I saw a lot of things that I did not do correctly. And he said, turn it around, look at this racetrack, a different racetrack. Hopefully, I get experience here. As we remain under yellow here at Phoenix International Raceway, we would like to thank our partners, XM Satellite Radio, Honda, Firestone, and Penzl, Quaker State, for their support of ABC Sports' groundbreaking side-by-side -side coverage of today's race. Question in my mind right now is who's going to stop? I'm not so sure who's going to stop and who isn't. Are we going to have that split uh, in strategy again? What do you think, Scott? Well, you know, 115 laps right now. If you actually pitted and we got another yellow or two, you might not have to actually come in for a splash and go of fuel. So this is where the risk reward ratio has to pay off. And a lot of guys in pit lane have to make that decision. It's a 160 mile an hour chess match as we check in with Dr. Jerry Punch. Dario Franchitti cannot, I repeat, he cannot make it the rest of the way on fuel. You're right, Scotty, he will have to have a splash and go. Routine stop, no changes. Let's check in the pit. Yes. Well, Jerry, it's also a routine stop for your current leader, Elio Castroneves. They just the fuel and he lights it up. And now it's a case as to who will get to the line first, Jamie? Guys, Ryan Briscoe just came in and they just made a face at the rear right suspension. Also, Chip Ganassi said they may have done some damage to the front suspension. He's still sitting in his pit box. They're saying cut it. They're calling it a day, guys. All right, well done to some of the best pit reporters in the business as we have got 116 laps complete as we get a look at number 33. That is Ryan Briscoe. We will step aside, take a break, and we come back more racing from Phoenix International Raceway right here on ABC Sports. Back at Phoenix International Raceway where your leader is Elio Castroneves, followed by teammate Sam Hornish, but can they run it to the end? We'll be back after this from our ABC stations. Back at Phoenix International Raceway as we give you a quick recap of what has happened thus far as we take a look at our leader, Elio Castro Neves. And it all came down to the start and fellow Brazilian, Tony Canon. Tony made a fantastic first lap going around the outside of everyone. It's just an incredible speed differential there. Buddy Rice, the defending Indianapolis 500 champion, suffers his second DNF this season and then it was Australian Ryan Briscoe hits the wall in turn four. And that's where we stand right now with Elio Castro Neves as our leader as we send it down to Jackaroo. And his pit stops are better, Todd. And why? Because he can finally find his pits. Remember, he missed it in the Indy 500. So what the team has done is they've added a giant flag that Elio can see from the cockpit. Also, he's using his road racing seat. It's about an inch higher, fellas. He says the view's good. That's why he's out front with quick stops. It's always good when you're out in front as the green flag comes out. It's Elio Castroneves leading them around with Sam Hornis Jr. in second place. Teammates battling down the front straightaway. Great restart by Sam. He's down the inside and he... Yai, yai, yai. Oh, Jill, you know how hard that is to come out of turn three and four and get the power down oh. side by side. Touching the teammates right now. No team orders going in three and four. Man, they're wide open. I guarantee you, pedal to the metal, and Elio saying, there's no way you're going to get by me, but I don't think he's got it. Elio remembers Miami just a year ago when he got passed by Hornish on the very first race of Sam's introduction to the team. Well, they're teammates, but Elio Castro Neves has a tattoo on the side of his car right now, courtesy of his teammate, Sam Hornish Jr., who now is out in front. I told you there was no team orders. <laughs> but don't you think Roger Penske's going, fellas, oh, come on. Here's and here comes Daddy on the, on the wind side. So while Elio Castroneves, the three car, is licking his wounds, Dario Franchitti slides in, he's in second place. Castroneves slid back to third, and Horn is out in front. I told you, one mistake, and if you can't make by the guy in front, the guy behind will get you, and that's exactly what happened with Elio there. And Jill, I wonder, that last pit stop, obviously you want to make changes to set yourself up for the remaining part of the race. Did Elio maybe make the wrong change on his car? Because he's certainly not as strong now, but you know how KG Sam Hornish is. He's sort of like a Rick Mears. He just takes his time, works on his car, and gets it set up for the end of the race, and it looks like maybe he's got the setup right now that's going to work. I put all that down to that restart. Sam got a better restart, put himself in the inside, and that was that. Let's check in with Jackaroo. 
Well, you can see Roger Penske who calls the shots for Sam Hornish. I tried to get a word with him, fellas. He is so glued to what's going on that forget team orders. He's not even thinking about Elio Castroneves right now. He wants to get Sam Hornish to the front. He told me he's, we'll leave the calls as far as Elio Castroneves is concerned with Tim Sindrick, the president, who calls the strategy. Doesn't want to talk right now, guys. I think he's wound up a little tight. Yeah, good observation there, Jack. I don't know if I'd want to be at the Marlboro Team Penske post-race barbecue, but right now it is Sam Hornish Jr. out in front, Dario Franchini in second, and Elio Castroneves, Jill, as you said, made one small mistake, and he's paid the price. He's paid the here price, and here comes Dario down the inside of Sam. Ay, ay, ay. Look at Sam on the outside, Jill. Just keeps his foot into it all the way on the high side. Amazing. And it's Elio Castroneves decides to join in the party, the 27 of Dario Franchini to the inside, and he closes the door. He's got him. He's got him. That's it. That's Dario in the lead. Great move by Dario. He's stuck in there and kept his foot in. He's really hot today, huh? Let, let's send someone down to the pit area for Dario Franchini and find out what he had for breakfast because it was a whole helping of courage. He is out in front now with the Team Penske boys chasing him down. Hey, Scottish Parish. Franchini said a moment ago, I think he's a little angry right now because he said Hornish hit him early in the race and he told his crew, I'm going to pay him back if I need to to make the pass. He didn't need to, but he did make the pass. And Jill, this is a different Dario Franchitti. When he came into the series, he looked almost timid on the one-mile tracks. And Andretti Green has always had one of the best one-mile packages in the business over everybody else. And he's just got, you talk about courage, I'm not sure. I mean, he's like a lion right now. As you saw the Toyota lap leaders go by, there's a whole lot of parody out there today. But Dario Franchitti, I, I agree. I, what has gotten into him? Uh, Dario is a very aggressive driver today. But what I think makes Dario very good in the mile overs is he's very sensitive. He knows what he needs out of the car. He's very good at setting up the car. He's one of the few drivers that can mix the two together. Knows what, he knows what he needs and he can drive fast and obviously he can pass too. So it is Dario Franchitti out in front, Sam Hornish Jr. in second, Elio Castroneves sits in third. We have completed 133 laps. And he's slowly pulling away, little by little. He's running about a well, mile and a half, uh, an hour faster than uh, what Sam is uh, running right now. Great racing thus far at the XM Satellite Radio 200. We have 167 laps remaining until the exciting conclusion, and you'll see it right here on ABC Sports. It's the series premiere of Eyes. It premieres Wednesday, March 30th at 10, 9 central. And it follows an all new episodes of Lost and Alias. Critics are calling it cool, stylish, and smart. Tim Daly stars, they're watching out for you. And it's only on ABC. Well, your racing action looks like this. It's Dario Franchitti out in front. And moments ago, Jill, you made a point. He is consistently faster by over a mile an hour as we check in quickly with Jerry Punch. Well, Todd, the good news here in the Franchitti pit is that their driver is indeed pulling away. But here's the bad news. Their calculations show that he's going to be about 18 laps shy on fuel. He cannot make it much past lap 181. These final 20 laps with a splash of pit stop should be very exciting. I wonder if there's anybody out there thinking about conserving fuel just in case they get that yellow later on. I mean, in that situation, you got two things to do. Either you go for the net. For the next for the uh, for the next pit stop or you conserve fuel wait for the yellow. He's sharp who's going very well in fourth place and about to get attacked by Tony Canaan. Scott Sharp there, number eight. Clear all around. Good job. Credit to him, Scotty, making his 100th start here. He's pretty much been with the IRL for the whole ride. You know, just an incredible job. You know, 92 consecutive starts. He was out for quite some time with a concussion. And when he came back here, he won this race on his second time back, which is pretty impressive. But the Delphi car right now looks to be pretty solid. Asked him after warm-ups this morning. He said, I think we got a good car. For more on Scott Sharp, let's check in with Jamie Little. Well, guys, he's walking around the pit. Scott Sharp has a huge smile on his face, and he says it's the new team. They have the Honda power this year. He's feeling great, and like you said, he's celebrating his 100th start, but right now he says his car is working great. He had a little hold up. Alex Barron is a lap down and held him on for a few laps, but how exciting would that be for him to take home a win on his 100th start? 146 laps complete. Dario Franchini still your leader. Sam Hornis Jr. second. Elio Castroneves and Scott Sharp sits in fourth. 
There's your leader, number 27, as he goes around the 17 of Vitor Mera. It is the ARCA X ride, and Dreddy Green team member of Dario Franchitti. Well, Dario Franchitti was the mile master in 2004 with wins at historic Milwaukee Mile and Pikes Peak with his wife there. We touched on it earlier, Scott. What makes him have the Midas touch at both these tracks and again today here at Phoenix? I think like Jill said, you know, just the smoothness, the finesse, knows what he wants in the car, incredibly fit. I think that he's just got a great pace today. Nobody can keep up with it. Vitor Mera, number 17, part of that Ray Hall Letterman crew. He comes in as well, gets a quick splash of gas. Now, Vitor Mera will be shuffled to the back of the pack, but Jill, you start to see a little bit with 50 laps remaining. The strategy coming in play, as Jerry Punch pointed out, they know that Dario can't make it the whole way. He's going to have to hope for a yellow. Yeah, he's going to have to hope for a yellow. I wonder if if Mera is stopped now, because now he knows he can make it to the end. If right. there is a yellow, everybody comes in, he'll go to the front of the pack. Is that what's going to happen, Scott? Well, you know, I would say that's a great strategy, but, you know, the great Ray Hall team has not been typically that fast on one-mile tracks, and he looks like he's been struggling, so I sort of wonder if he came in to make some changes just to survive the car so he didn't end up in a situation like Buddy Rice. I think you're right, and I think I'm very wrong now that I think <laughs> a little more about it. That's what I love about Gilles. He can admit when he's wrong, but it doesn't happen very often as we look at number 17. Vitor Mera, part of that Ray Hall Letterman crew, as they alluded to, Buddy Rice, the defending Indianapolis 500 champion, went out early in the race. That leaves Vitor Mera and Danica Patrick. Hey, fellas, I've checked up and down pit road as far as is there any driver in the front runners that can go the distance. Good news for your current leader. Of course, we heard about the fact that Frankini is going to have to pit. So are all the people chasing him. It's going down to about lap 185, lap 186. It is going to get nasty, Jerry Punch, here on pit road in that final stop. Exactly, Jack. And what's happening here right now is that the guys in the Ryan Herta pit are really looking at the fuel mileage. If you watch Dario Franchitti work traffic, they're really trying to work the fuel mileage here in the Brian Herta pit. And a great battle up front. We are being told here that possibly Brian Herta might be able to make it. They're really going to be close. All right, thank you, Dr. Punch. Great battle up front is Dario Franchitti. He is now getting the pressure from the six of Sam Hornis Jr. and Elio Castro Nevis. They're back in the fight. It's the whole unpredictability about that traffic, and here we goes. He got blocked out by Scott Dixon, and here comes Sam Hornis still attacking. You can never relax in this racetrack. You think you got a nice lead, here you hit traffic, and that's the situation you find yourself in, getting challenged by 10 people at once. With 45 laps to go, obviously the speeds are going to have to come Elio. down just a little bit, and Elio trying to make a move right there. Scott, will that help them on fuel conservation? Well, right now you're up and down on the throttle, so much work on that engine. The key thing is, I'll tell you, the driver is not even thinking about fuel right now. This is just fun for these guys sitting in the seat. You know, their heart rate's going at 160 or 180 beats per minute right now as he's trying to take a peek right underneath of Danica. Castro Nevis is having a look. The key thing of traffic that Jill spoke about, that just gets your heart rate going even more. And this time of the race, the tires are a little, a little more worn. There's not as good as just when they just came out of the pits. The car is very slippery. You are all over the place, just fighting to gain control. And Dixon is trying not to fall a lap behind, and he's going to make Darius' life very, very difficult. This is exciting to watch, I tell you. Scott Dixon currently sits in 11th, so they've lapped that far up. And look at this, Dario Franchini trying to take a look on the inside as he oh, comes watch the exit. number one. Watch, watch. watch the exit. Watch the uh, exit. Not quite. This is the beauty of side-by-side -side racing on ABC Sports. We'll take care of our sponsors. You get to watch some great racing action from Phoenix on ABC Side-by-Side. Welcome back to Phoenix International Raceway. A quick reminder, tomorrow, 3 Eastern, 12 Pacific, it's the Spurs versus the Pistons or the Suns versus the Grizzlies. The NBA on ABC Sports. 166 laps completed. The XM Satellite Radio Indy 200. Dario Franchini out in front. Sam Hornis Jr. in second. Elio Castro Nevis. The problems yield the and those three really are the class of the field with Tony Kanaan moving up. But lap traffic is really wreaking havoc. It's so unpredictable that nothing is for sure. Anything can change any minute. In one minute, you think Dario is comfortable in the lead. Next minute, Sam is right there. There were so many near misses during the last five minutes or so. And he continues to be in heavy traffic. 
You saw the Toyota lap leaders go by. Dan Wilden had the most, but he has been shuffled back to sixth place. Where has Dan Wilden gone? You know, Dan Wilden had a dominant car when he was out in front and actually had clean air. And I'm wondering if they had enough downforce on the car for him to actually be able to go through traffic when he had all that dirty air from the cars in front. So maybe he doesn't have a user-friendly car right now, Joe Farron. It's a trade-off. I mean, you can't go fast on clean air and be good in traffic. You've got to choose one or the other. With 30 laps to go, how will this thing play out? It's Dario Franchitti coming up on his teammate, and we mentioned earlier, remember, Dr. Jerry Punch reported these two were not getting along too well earlier, and now it's Dario Franchitti set to lap Brian Herta. As you take a look at the Firestone telemetry, Brian Herta letting up the throttle, doing the wise thing, letting his teammate get by. A very nice gesture by Brian Herta. Maybe if there has been some ill feelings, Maybe that's turning around and actually just saying, hey, sorry about that previously. But, Jill, the key thing right now, as you know as a driver, the last stop that's coming up, it's going to be track position, which we talked about. The key thing as a driver, you're telling the team what's going on with the car, and most importantly, what changes you want on this last stop, because that's going to give you the car you're going to have to race with for those last 15, 20 laps. Absolutely, and now is the time of the race when you see whose car is really underneath them or not. And you see Thomas started the race strong, and Dario just blew by him to put him a, a, a lap down. Dario Franchitti continues to lead. And word from the track is Thomas Schechter, the four. Penzoil is starting to slow considerably. His last speed coming around was 151 miles an hour, which is about 16 miles an hour off the pace. Can't tell. It's hard to say what's going on there. You know, there was a time when he was almost it's handling. Oh, whoa, 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 watch that. Ooh. Talk about a loose race car right now. So what he's doing, he's trying to hold on to the next yellow situation or when he has to come into the pits. But as we saw with Buddy Rice, Jill, sometimes you just don't make it that far. Hey, if I was him, I'll come in right now because that looks dangerous. You know, it's almost as loose as it was. He, he might actually have a bright flat tire. Someone's listening to Gilles DeFerrin because Thomas Schecker decides to come in and take care of the problem. His teammate Thomas Engie's already gone out of the race, so I know the folks at Chevrolet would love to keep him out on the track, get him the seat time, and get him the finish. On board with Thomas Schechter, he'll get the splash of gas, so he'll have what he needs. How much they do to the car? Well, it's a quick pit stop, just over 10 seconds, and Schechter's back in. That was, uh, his, his handling was diabolical. I wonder if something's broken there uh, or it's only tires. What do you think, Scott? Well, you know, I didn't think I saw any wind changes on the front, so that's what sort of made me believe as we watch in front of the pits now and join traffic on the backstretch in the kink trying to get up to speed. Sort of wondered if maybe he had a tire going down over running some, over some debris or something. Great view from the Quaker State pit exit cam. 176 laps complete. Your leader remains number 27. That man, Dario Franchitti, out in front as he go past, goes past A.J. Foyt, the fourth number 14 and here comes the chase pack number six it's Sam Hornish Jr. Does he have what it takes to reel in Dario Franchitti and Franchitti's gonna have to pit we know that. Well I think everybody's gonna have to pit but you see that Dario is slowly pulling away from Sam Hornish Jr. He's now two seconds up the road but there's always a traffic situation that comes again and again and again and again so it's I I'm not that confident to say that yeah, he's got the race in his pocket. It, there's still a lot that can happen. And Jill, you know the other thing that comes into play right now also, as a driver, the last pit stop, especially if it's under green, you cannot make a mistake. Your in-lap has to be very quick, your out-lap has to be very quick, or you can lose any advantage that you've made on the racetrack. That last pit stop is going to be everything. One mistake in that last pit stop, and yep. as, your day's ruined. As Jack Arood alluded to, it's great news for everyone else that Dario has to pit, but they all have to pit. As you see, the lap since last pit, around 60, and it looks like they're starting to get together. And Dario Franchitti's boys are coming out, and Franchitti's coming in. Final pit stop for Franchitti. Now watch Corey McLeish. He's the fueler. There are lights in his helmet that the engineers will click on when they have enough fuel. It takes six seconds for tires and about nine seconds for fuel. Franchitti down and away. They hope they got it half full, which should be enough to go to the checkered flag. 7.6 seconds for Dario Franchitti. He comes down. Pit exit row with 60 miles an hour. That is the max. So Sam Hornis Jr. goes to the lead. Elio Castroneves in second. How is this going to play out, gentlemen? Did Dario make the right move? Well, it, the, the, the Pinsky guys are trying to stretch the fuel as much as they can, but now watch for Dario's lap time. He's got a half a tank of gas and new tires. He's going to be flying through the field and quickly trying to unlap himself. 
from these two guys, which is what happened when you come into the pits on the green. Scotty, he can run full rich, as Jill pointed out, but does he have enough time with just 18 laps to go to catch the leaders? Well, the key thing, once the Penske cars stop for their pits, we're going to end up seeing exactly where they're going to play into this whole situation. The thing that impresses me, guys, that we've not touched on right now, Toyota engines. They must have obviously done some updates because right now, not, although this is maybe not necessarily a full horsepower track, it's down handling. They've done a great job right now because Toyota's running 1-2. Oh, great racing Sam action. And we'd like to thank our partners, Toyota, k and Filters, Castrol, and Genworth Financial for their support of ABC Sports' groundbreaking side-by-side -side coverage of today's race. It's been fantastic not having to miss anything, and we've got a good one here in Phoenix. Sam Hornis Jr., your leader. Elio Castro Nevis sits right behind him. They are teammates. Would you play a little diciness where you leave one car out, Scott, and bring one in? Absolutely. That's probably what they're going to do. Watch how close. Whoa. Oh, that was close. I'll tell you. Hornish just going around the full outside right now of Darren Manning, who seems to have fallen off the pace just a little bit. Didn't want to go down a lap, but he couldn't hold Sam back, Jill. And Sam, I think, has got four more laps he can do before he's got to come in and pitch. So if no yellow comes out in this four laps, ooh, that was close again. Man, he really runs close to everyone. And, um, you know, if no yellow comes out, then they should come back around in the same order that they always started to come in. Sam Hornish Jr., your leader, he started sixth, but you can see his progression as he's worked his way and driven a masterful race as he got gets around. Darren Manning working his way, but remember, with 15 laps to go, they are going to have to pit Dan Wilden, number 26, the man who led for much of the race, has come in, decided to pit, followed by his teammate, number 11, Tony Kanaan. Watch to see if any changes happen on the car up in the front wing section by any of the crew members. No changes looks to be, that means he's happy with his car. Just needs to get out and see if he can catch up to the leaders. For Tony Kanaan, it may be a case of one pit too many when he came in when they had that fueling situation earlier in the race, but Kanaan back out. And here comes Sam Hornish Jr., the leader, into the pits. So your leader comes in, decides to pit, and they do, in fact, leave the other car out. Sam Hornis Jr. will come in. That will put Elio Castro Nevis out in front. Some front wing changes went on with Sam's car there. And remember, fellas, Hornish didn't have to stay as long on pit road as Frank Keaty because with a gravity fuel flow, he went nine laps longer. And here comes Frank Keaty. Let's see where they come out. If if is he going to come out ahead of Frank Keaty? Yes, he is. So He's there's Sam going Kitty. through the kink on the back section right now and directly just falling back behind him is Frank Keaty, who is at speed. Now, you know, Jill, as we're watching Sam getting involved in traffic, Frank Keaty sees what's going up ahead right now. He knows he has warm tires and the car's up to speed. Here comes Elio Castro Nevis, the final Penske car to come in, so he will pit. One more time, let's sit it down in his pit with Jack Aru. Elio Castro Nevis with that road racing seat to increase his visibility, saw the flight. Again, the fuel flow very quickly. And here comes Hornish out of turn number four. Can he come up through the gearbox quick enough not to go down to his teammate? Let's see where he comes out. It's gonna, gonna be gonna really it. close, really close. Oh my God. Ooh. Hornish and Frank Keaty with the momentum because they're up to speed. Yep. Will he make it around the top side? Oh, that's no how you there. work it. So Sam Hornis Jr. maintains the leads. Elio Castro Nevis unable to get up to speed quick enough. And Dario Franchitti. Where did Dan Weldon come from? I missed him. <laughs> With 10 laps to go in Phoenix, it plays down like this. Sam Hornis Jr., your leader. Dario Franchitti in second place. And they do not need to pit again. Dan Weldon is a lap behind. Yes. So the car in the middle of your screen, number 26, is Dan Wilton, the man who won at Miami Homestead last week. Number six is your leader. That is Sam Hornis Jr. And well, Dario Franchini, the blue and white Arc X, sits in second place. What Weldon needs to do right now is to leave room for Dario Franchini, the 27 car, the red, white, and blue car, to get through because he's actually taking up time, not allowing him to get to the front. Yeah, I don't understand what he's doing. You're right. I mean, he needs to let Dario go by. Well, we all made our selections at the top of the show. Who we go. thought would win at this point, gentlemen, I'll give you a chance to do a do-over. Scotty, what do you think? Well, I had said Frank Keaty before, and I still hold true, but Sam is one tough guy to pass, as you know, Joe. He's very tough. Oh, yellow. We got a yellow. yellow. We talked about the ill-handling car of Thomas Schechter as it seemed like it was going off, and they came in, put new tires on. Evidently, guys, 
not a better handling car from the time that he came in previously. Probably no changes on the car, I think, as we saw. I tell you, the key moment now that we need to look forward to is re that restart. Yeah, absolutely. Everything is going to hang on that restart. You miss a gear, you accelerate at the wrong time, any measle, slight mistake, and your race is finished. As we saw in that restart with Elio and Sam, Sam yeah. got the power down in three and four, got the acceleration, the drive off the turn, going into turn one, and as with lap 194, this is going to be a three or a four lap shootout. And Jill, you know what that does to your heart rate. I tell you, if I was sitting in that car right now, I will be huffing and puffing and grabbing that steering wheel and biting that balaclava like you have no idea. <laughs> So it's Sam Hornis Jr., your leader. Dario Franchini sits in second with six laps remaining in this race. It'll take a few laps to get Thomas Schechter's car clear as we go on board to find out exactly what happened. Rolling off the throttle. He knows he's in trouble. And a slight kiss of the wall. You know, I, there was no tire problems from what it looked like before, so it makes you wonder if maybe he had hit somebody and turned around and hit something on the suspension had that car just not working very well. So while we sit in yellow, let's send it down to Dr. Jerry Punch with a very special guest. Well, Ashley Judd is showing her uh, Kentucky color. She's hoping her Wildcats will win tonight. Ashley, you're the good luck charm. You were with him twice last year when your husband won races. Can he pull it off now? I absolutely think he can. All weekend he's been saying he loved his car, particularly in the corners. It was a beast. He kept encouraging me to go to my game because he knows how much my Wildcats mean to me, but I knew he thought he had a car that could win it, and I wasn't going to miss that for the world. Well, you're showing the Wildcat colors pretty well. They play tonight against Cincinnati. It could be a double win today for this family. Well, of course, that would be my ideal. My team is playing really well. We can play actually some fabulous, great, epic basketball at times. What I hope they do tonight is turn out with a lot of spirit. Uh, which has been lacking on occasion, which I don't really understand. That's not typical for the Kentucky Wildcats, but I think that we'll be all right against Cincinnati. Well, your husband not lacking any spirit now. I just heard him on the radio a moment ago say it's all about the restart. He's ready. He's pretty fired up. He's pretty fired up. And I have to say, Sam Hornish is not his favorite person, so. <laughs> this could be interesting, guys. Forget Ow. Dick Vitale. Let's get Ow. Ashley Judd in the booth. <laughs> So it's going to come down to this, the restart, which is all important, and it'll be Sam Hornish Jr. and Dario Franchini, one and two, and as Dario's wife said, not the best of friends as we check in with Jackaroo. Well, Roger Penske is calling the shots on the guy that's going to have to come up through the gearbox. We're talking about Sam Hornish. This has been a wild race, Roger. Well, it's been a great race. You can see how competitive this series really is. We really don't get the credit. A lot of passing, real good pit stops. Uh, going to be tough here at the end. Uh, the 27's got tired, but, uh, you know, we got harnessed. What's the key with Sam? What are you going to tell him just before they drop the green flag? Tell, tell him to get a real good start. Roger Penske ought to know, before he started winning all these races, he was in the cockpit as well, guys. 40 years of experience there, Jack and Jill DeFerrin. He said a very, very key thing there. Hornish did not change tires yep. on his last pit stop. Hey, Scott, what do you think? Make you a little nervous on that restart, <laughs> Well, Scott? you know, and Frank Keaty knows that, so he will have the grip in the turn, maybe over Hornish. Watch for him to try and carry that speed up 3-4 we talked about. And, you know, go around the high side on turns one and two, Jill. He did uh, add front wing, though. Let's remember that. Yeah, but uh, there's no front wing that can make up for a new set of tires. <laughs> Four brand new canoes are better than front wing, what that's for sure. What he do for a set of Firestone Firehawks right about now, and I wonder if Dario Franchini knows that. Uh -huh. Well, with three laps to go, it comes down to this, gentlemen. Show your cards. It's a good game of Arizona Hold'em. Sam Hornis Jr., Dario Franchini, one and two with three laps to go. Green this time. Ay, 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 I'm nervous. <laughs> Sam slowing it right to the very last minute. Green flag is out. Sam Hornis Jr. gets a good jump, but can Dario get a run on him? Good restart, good restart. And Sam's got right down the very bottom, making him go around the high side, did the right thing. Yeah, but he took his air up. Ooh, oh, that, Dario that hits comes the in contact with the wall. Yeah. Will that bring out a yellow? No, nope. no yellow. Uh, that was a very defensive move by Sam. You know, he saw he saw Dario on the outside. He just kept moving up. But the reason that happened is that because the dirty air off of Sam's car in front got onto Dario's car. He did not have the grip in the turn. Didn't have the speed to get those downforce working. It the, just got real high. The white flag is out. The final lap. Sam Hornis Jr. out in front with one more turn. He picks up his 13th career win, first since 04 in Homestead. Your winner, Sam Hornis Jr. Great.
great it's drive a by one two day for that man, Roger Penske, as he celebrates 40 years of racing. And Gilles DeFerrin, you know maybe better than anyone what that means to those two. Forget about the tattoo that Edel Castro Nevis got from Sam Hornis Jr. earlier. All is forgiven. Uh, Theo, there is no team orders in the with, between those guys, and uh, let's review that uh, the restart it's again. It's a 200-lap race, but it all came down to the final three. Sam Hornis Jr.'s restart, impeccable. A perfect job by Sam, making sure that Dario had to go around the high side. Then he moves high going into the turn, and now Dario's up even higher. He gets that dirty air off the car in front, and then he's lost the grip, guys. Sam Hornis Jr. takes a well-deserved victory lap here in the Valley of the Sun, despite the sun not showing today. Perfect weather conditions as Sam Hornis has a great race all the way to the check. Great race, and he did a very smart move. I don't think it was an illegal move. I think it was a very experienced move. So it's Sam Hornis Jr. who picks up the winner. He gets the victory. Dario Franchitti will have to settle for an unfortunate placing. When we come back, we'll talk to all the key players. In IndyCar racing, it's all about high risk and high reward. And the guy that went all in to win this race is with me now. Sam, tell me about that restart, that last lap. Were you blocking? Well, you know, uh, we had a really good day, uh, the Marble Team Penske guys, and we stayed, uh, elected to stay on, the, on uh, the tires that we ran the long run before that. So I just picked my line, and it was just like any of the high mile, you know, the, the high bank tracks that we run at. You pick your line and you stay there, and I just went, I just picked the bottom coming right off the corner and took it all the way down the front straightaway. So uh, How wide did the car get, though? Not at all. <laughs> It's hard to pass on the outside of turn one. I tried to go around the outside of Dario there a couple times, so I knew when he went to go to the outside of me that it was going to be a hard road to go. But, uh, you know, these Marble Team Penske guys did an awesome job for me in the pits today. And we just had a, had a heck of a lot of fun out there and just bided our time and made it to the end of the race. Let's talk about that last pit stop, because Dario Franchitti came in about 10 laps He's sooner than you did. The Marlboro Penske crew went to work with you flawlessly. Didn't have to take on as much fuel, but boy, they got you in and out faster than I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, we went in and out real quick. These guys have been working real hard on their pit stops. I'm super proud of them. They've done a great job. And the, one of the biggest things about this uh, this is, is you know, the littlest amount of time that you can spend in the pits. And we knew that, you know, as we didn't do tires, that we could just put enough fuel in to make it to the end. And, you know, it was just enough of what we needed. Todd, his dream is to win the Indianapolis 500 and then play in the World Series of Poker. I think today he put all the chips on the line. Let's find out what the river card is when we get to Indianapolis. Thank you very much, Jack, and congratulations to Sam Hornis Jr. He unofficially picks up the victory at the XM Satellite Radio Indy 200, followed by Elio Castroneves. Tony Kanan, Dario Franchitti has to settle for fourth place. We come back, more interviews with the key players after this short break. You back to the outskirts of Phoenix on a not warm day, but a very comfortable day. We sit it back down to the track, and that is where Dr. Jerry Punch is standing by with Dario Franchitti. Thank you very much, Todd. And Dario, you drove like a man possessed today. Take us to that restart when you were trying to move in on Hornish there with a couple laps to go. Yeah, with the way the strategy worked out and um, some of my teammates get, or one of my teammates getting in the way, we, we kind of had to do a lot of work on that last restart. And um, I threw the dice and I knew I had to get them before we got back into a rhythm there. I know it was green, white checker. I had to make a move soon and um, I, I tried and understood up on the wall. Um, it's a shame the Arca X car was, was pretty mega all day. And um, I kind of I thought we had, we had the car to win. You got a tap from Hornish early in the race, and the guys in the pit said, if you're going to drive like that, we're going to have him hit you every week. So uh, you, you, you were ready to get up there and be able to have a little payback time. I wasn't going to hit him. I just wanted to get by him. Um, yeah, he, you know, he, he hit me. I saw him hit somebody else out there. Um, but I, I have to say in the last restart, he was absolutely did nothing wrong. A great effort today. Thank you. Dario Franchitti finishes fourth. Todd? Thank you, Dr. Jerry Punch, and the drama continues as we get set for St. Petersburg, our next stop. We'd like to thank our partners, Energizer Batteries, Yamaha Motorcycles, Eli Lilly Cialis, and ESPN Russell Racing School for their support of ABC Sports' groundbreaking side-by-side -side coverage of today's race. When we come back, we'll wrap it up from Phoenix. Welcome back to Phoenix. I'm Jamie Little with the runner-up, Elio Castroneves. This man kept it exciting from start to finish. A little bumping and grinding never stopped the power of the Toyotas. Huh? Take us through your run today, Elio. I tell you, I, I hope you guys had a lot of fun because I did a, hell, a lot of fun, you know. We made a right choice. It was a great performance from our team, Penske. You know, it's, um, 
it's a shame on my group, but I'm happy for the team because the team has been working so hard, you know, so finally got it. We're going to see you turning right next week. Big time, St. Pete. Wait for me. <laughs> Two weeks, Jeff. Back to the front, back to the front. TK, no three-peat today, but a good run. I mean, yeah, I mean, we definitely had a car to win this race, but, uh, you know, we had a lot of problems all week, and including during the race, uh, a few probe wouldn't put the, uh, whoa, wouldn't put the, all the few inch I had to stop twice, but um, the guy did a great job, and um, I'll take third having a bad day, you know? Hey, Todd, we got to throw it back up to you. The jet dryers are coming, and we're getting blown away down here. That's a whole lot of hot air down there on pit row. Tony Kanan and Jack Aroot. As we step aside, we want to remind you the month of May on ABC Sports. May 14th is poll day. May 22nd, bump day. And of course, it all leads up to May 29th. The Indy 500, we're back in Phoenix in just a moment. Back in Phoenix International Raceway, Scott Sharp celebrates his 100th career IndyCar start with a great top five finish. Uh, congratulations, Scotty. Thank you, Jerry. Just so pleased with the whole Delphi Fernandez team. The guys gave me great stops. You know, there was times when we had the fastest car out there, and we just got stuck in some traffic. Some guys were pretty stubborn today, and, you know, hey, we still ended up with a top five finish, gained some points back on everybody, and uh, it's just feel real fortunate for this whole uh, new opportunity. First top five for Scott Sharp since Michigan in 2003. He says, guys, it's just the beginning of what's to come this year for this team. And congratulations, Scott Sharp, the pitcher of longevity. As we take a look at the unofficial results, Sam Hornis Jr. with the victory, Elio Castroneves, Tony Kanaan, Dario Franchitti, and there's Scott Sharp finishing in fifth place. Dan Willen had a great run, dominated the Toyota lap sled. He finishes up in sixth place. Brian Herter, who sat on the pole, finishes in seventh. And gentlemen, it's what we thought, Jill. Phoenix delivers once again. Absolutely, and the move of the race was um, Sam Hornish on that restart. He was really smart in keeping Dari behind him and won the race. And the key thing that I like right now is we see that Sam Hornish is the points leader over Danny Weldon. The winner in Miami is Toyota. Seems like they're back with some horsepower, Jill. We look forward to St. Petersburg. The Toyotas go one and two today at Phoenix and an impressive performance by Sam Hornish Jr. and his teammate, Elio Castro Nevis, the field was stellar, no question about it, as we say goodbye to the Valley of the Sun. Well, that'll do it for Phoenix, Arizona. And we want to remind you our next race, the Honda Indy Grand Prix, St. Petersburg, Florida, April 3rd, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. And of course, our next race on ABC, the 89th running of the Indianapolis 500, the big one, Sunday, May 29th at noon Eastern time, the greatest show in racing. And tomorrow, join ABC for regional NBA action at 3 p.m. Eastern. You'll see either the Spurs battle the Pistons or the Suns take on the Grizzlies. So on behalf of Gilles DeFerrin, Scott Goodyear, Jack Aruth, Jerry Punch, and Jamie Little, I'm Todd Harris saying so long from Phoenix. ABC Sports is online at ESPN.com. Search ABC Sports, bringing you the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. This is ABC Sports Championship Television. Your winner, Sam Hortis Jr.